voila. Yeah, you can hear me now? Cool. Thank you, uh, Joanna, and thank you, Heidi, and everyone for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I've really enjoyed the presentations that I've heard, and I look forward to continuing our discussions. So today I'm going to be talking about um, misinformation broadly in the era of COVID-19, so focusing mostly on the pandemic. 
and in keeping with the conference's themes, really exploring the relationship between metaphor and misinformation and how these are fueled and amplified by religion and the media. But first, before we explore COVID, I want to look a little, about seven years or eight years ago, back in 2015. And Jessica Ainska, who you see on this slide, the self-described wellness warrior, was trying to cure herself naturally of cancer. Now, Ainska had been diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer and had taken it upon herself to try to cure herself through a combination of organic raw food, meditations, and daily coffee enemas. And she documented this whole experience, the rituals that she undertook on a daily basis on social media and also a blog, also entitled The Wellness Warrior. Now, The Wellness Warrior was a global success. It achieved over 1.5 million unique global visitors. And when she was interviewed by a magazine to ask about you know, why she had received such fame, they described her blog as, quote, the Bible for a generation longing to change their health, their environment, and their experience of life. Now, Ainska was an advocate of what's called the Gerson Protocol, and she used the Gerson Protocol to try to cure herself naturally. And here on this slide, you can see a day in the life of Gerson therapy as posted by Jess. And a couple of things might strike you upon glancing at the, at the daily routine that she endured. The first one is, is the consumption of juice. There's a lot of juice that goes on on a daily basis. <laughs> And also um, the number of coffee enemas and the monotony, the sheer monotony and the dedication to this daily ritual that she would share. But it's also quite poignant for the theme of the conference because in addition to her particular case, it really shows the power of purgation and purification metaphors in wellness culture today. Now, Gerson therapy has been widely disproven. However, Jess still was a true believer. She believed that through having these coffee enemas and these daily juices that she would be detoxifying herself and removing the toxins and in, in, um, as a byproduct, curing herself of cancer. I think it's a very fitting place to start with Jess because not only does her story exemplify the power of metaphor and misinformation, but as a prominent social media influencer, really at the start of blogging and the rise of influencers as we know them today, she also brings together a story about the media and, as I will show, religion. Now, illness has been long represented through metaphor. In her 1978 classic, Illness as Metaphor, the US philosopher Susan Sontag criticized the moralizing of disease metaphors. And Sontag was reflecting on her own experience with cancer, wherein cancer was often represented as an invasion, a fight, and the responsibility for both the cause and the fight against it was placed upon the individual. Now, Sontag traces such metaphors back to myths about tuberculosis in the early 20th century. However, these myths and metaphors are alive and well and abundant in today's wellness culture wherein disease is thought to reflect the mental, the physical, and the spiritual state of the individual sufferer. And so it's quite common that people who are actually experiencing disease and illness will be told that they only need to shift their mindset in order to heal themselves or cure themselves of whatever affliction they're experiencing. The late Barbara Ehrenheit recounted similar exhortations when she experienced a cancer diagnosis to think positively despite being diagnosed with cancer. And she said that this was not only by you know, well-wishers or doctors and nurses, but by people who actually had cancer themselves. And often she would be directed towards these websites dedicated towards people who were experiencing cancer. And they would contain these pithy statements such as, uh, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Right? Don't wait for the ship to come in, swim out and meet it. And the point here is that the cancer diagnosis is no longer framed as a tragedy. It's framed as an opportunity for growth, learning and reflection. And as one book that she's very critical of, as a gift. 
So what these authors are really criticizing beyond metaphor is this idea of positive thinking and how it relates to what we term the law of attraction. And the law of attraction is this idea that like attracts like, that we are responsible for our destiny because we attract this by virtue of what we think and feel. And this is very critical, obviously, in the context of health because as Rhonda Byrne, author of the best-selling book and DVD, The Secret, claims, illness cannot exist in a body that has harmonious thoughts. And she also quotes the best-selling uh, self-help guru, Bob Proctor, who explains, disease cannot live in a body that's in a healthy emotional state. Now, bringing us forward towards the COVID-19 pandemic, metaphors were abundant. Politicians and journalists invoked military metaphors, describing COVID as an enemy, an invisible enemy, and health professionals, including doctors and nurses, as frontline soldiers in the fight against it. And in one sense, this makes sense, because we know that military metaphors are an effective way to galvanize a group against a perceived common enemy. But we also witnessed something relatively new during the pandemic. What we saw was not only the use of metaphor and misinformation and how this intersected with wellness culture, we also saw how these metaphors were used to spread conspiracy theories and also to facilitate extremism and, and online radicalization. So here you can just see some of the common ways in which misinformation led to real world harms and traveled online, things such as fraudulent products, we've got colloidal silver there, anti-vaccine discourse, common perceived enemies, often powerful, wealthy individuals such as Bill Gates or Dr. Anthony Fauci, and of course the conspiracy theory QAnon. And what I want to highlight is that this misinformation that circulated has not only been relegated to the start of the pandemic, it's still proliferating online, even when many people have returned to a so-called normal way of life. And so in my work, what I often trace are these influences, these alternative health and wellness influences. And one of the influences that I follow quite closely is David Avocado Wolf, who you can see on the screen. And if you go to David Avocado Wolf's website, you will see a series of products and services that are available in his shop. And this includes things like a series of products that you can use to protect yourself against the spike protein. And despite the very small disclaimer that insists that it will not protect you against a virus, you can see how this misinformation is still traveling and circulating and how many people are profiting from it uh, today. Now I would like to look at some of the key metaphors that were used to spread and amplify misinformation during the pandemic. And after that, I'll be looking at the role of technology in proliferating and spreading this misinformation, and finally, ending with some reflections on what we can do to counter it. So many of you, uh, a couple of months into the pandemic, may have been uh, privy to this film, Plandemic. Someone may have even shared it with you, but I'm sure most of you would have encountered it in one form or another. And Plandemic was a film that was released on the 4th of May, 2020, by Mickey Willis, the man that you can see on screen. And really the central false and misleading claims that the film circulated uh, was that COVID was a hoax and really that underneath it was this systematic scientific and medical corruption. And so you see this protagonist, Dr. Judy Mikovits, who was interviewed in the film and she was really the one who was using her personal story to make these claims. And it's no coincidence that she had a book that was published a couple of months afterwards that then became an Amazon bestseller. So not only did the film receive over 8 million views in the first week alone, but it was a very clever promotional uh, strategy for her books. And we see this a lot in the, in the misinformation space. But why I mention this in the context of metaphor is that metaphors were central to spreading this type of misinformation in the film. Viewers were told that we shouldn't fear the virus itself. In fact, it was fear that is the virus. We were also told that it's truth that is the cure. And this is crucial because anybody who studies this space of myths and disinformation and how it circulates online, especially in the last couple of years, would have noticed the centrality of truth as this ideal. 
So as we just saw in one of the previous presentations as well, uh, animal metaphors were also commonly invoked to depict those who either believed or complied with the official narrative, often the official government narrative, as sheep. And this metaphor invokes ideas about a herd, an uncritical mass who can't think for themselves. And of course, they are demarca demarcated from people who would hold contrarian positions, those that counter the official narrative. Many who criticized the official narratives presented their contrarian views as spurred by curiosity and critical thinking. They would often describe this process as going down the rabbit hole, a nod to Lewis Carroll's 1865 classic, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And again, the idea here isn't that you're falling blindly down some conspiracy theory rabbit hole, but it's this idea that through skepticism, critical thinking, often what they would just describe as just asking questions, that this process occurs. The red pill was another common metaphor that was used to spread misinformation during the pandemic. And the red pill, as many of you will know, is a term that comes from the matrix. And it's this idea about a shift in consciousness where one wakes up to the truth, where they've been living in this false reality. And it's through making the decision to take the red pill that one is awakened. And here you see one of the out health wellness influencers that I followed during the pandemic who was spreading a lot of medical misinformation, Pete Evans. And he was sharing numerous references to the matrix throughout as one of the ways in which he would try to recruit followers with these sometimes imagery, sometimes discourse. And he would often use this type of imagery to flirt with QAnon conspiracy theories, never outright showing this allegiance with QAnon, but really talking about this idea of taking the red pill, this importance of red pilling our family and our friends. So it's not just about the individual, it's a conversion act that we are called on um, to influence others. Now, much psychological literature, not just over the last few years, but in general, casts conspiracy theories as pathological or irrational. And according to much of this literature, there are certain psychological qualities or characteristics that a conspiracy theorist will have. And this will be things like susceptibility to paranoia, gullibility, and delusional ideation. And approaches of this kind are heavily influenced by the work of Karl Popper and Richard Hofstadter. And it's this idea that the conspiracy theory is a crippled epistemology emanating from a paranoid mind. Now in what follows, I want to take a different approach. I want to explore this notion of conspiracy theory as metaphor to understand how these metaphors operate as a gateway, not only to misinformation, but more broadly, online radicalization and extremism. And in keeping with the conference's themes, looking again at the relationship between religion and media. So I'm going to be making three arguments. The first is that the religious dimensions of wellness culture make it particularly susceptible to misinformation. The second is that the technological affordances of these online social media platforms fueled misinformation. And thirdly, is that we need to take into account these religious dimensions of much of the health and wellness misinformation, as well as how misinformation travels in order to actually have any success at countering it. So first of all, wellness discourse. So wellness discourse is infused with religious metaphors and imagery. Practitioners embarking on any wellness journey will often start with devotion, either to a particular food, diet, or lifestyle. And so many of you may yourselves have experienced this um, experience of going and becoming a vegan, or maybe it's going on the ketogenic diet. And it becomes this religious process of not only abstaining from certain foods, but actually um, experiencing a sort of transformation through clean eating and purification practices. And so here on the slide, you can see Gwyneth Paltrow, one of the leading wellness influencers with her book, The Clean Plate. And here it's this idea about a clean lifestyle, a pure lifestyle as part of this broader wellness lifestyle. Now, many people who are embarking on a wellness journey will often seek a guru to be their guide. 
The guru's role is to offer, in a sense, a form of salvation and to help them see the light. And just to give you some context into this work, I first started studying this space back in 2015 when a co-author and I were noticing just this proliferation of gurus online who were offering advice about health, wealth and relationships. And we were puzzled by this because it was quite obvious that the technological affordances of online platforms was facilitating this. But there was also something deeper at play and we were really trying to undercover what were the two or three conditions that were contributing to this proliferation of gurus online. And we noticed two. The first was the decline in many so-called secular societies of organized religion. So it's not that religion had been eroded entirely, but it's that organized religion had been uh, diminished and, and questioned, and there was this sense in many ways of a kind of disenchantment of institutional religion. And what this led was for many people to feel this sense of ontological insecurity, using Giddens' term, or uncertainty, where the moral scripts that they used to use to guide them in important life decisions, um, what career to pursue, who to marry, where to live, how to live, were no longer there. The second condition that we noticed was what we termed low trust society. And what we meant by that was not the absence of trust, but rather the decline of institutional trust and an increased skepticism of established experts who were associated with key institutions like the government, the medical establishment, the scientific establishment, and elites. And this is not really surprising in many ways because what these actors really symbolize is money and power. And so it's not that they're critical of experts per se, it's that they're critical of those who are associated with institutions. There are many experts that these people would endorse who are seen as contrarian doctors. They have the qualifications, but they're not affiliated with the institutions. But the result of both of these processes is that people often seek alternative spiritual guides to give them a sense of meaning, purpose, and understanding of how to live their lives. In many ways, for people experiencing a wellness lifestyle, it's a conversion process and it mimics religious conversion. So in the context of wellness, conversion often begins by making the decision to reset one's life. And it's a rebirth of sorts, where one shifts from an idea of having a poor diet, poor lifestyle, and negative thinking to a more positive, healthy outlook. And this is not something that's hidden. Many wellness influencers actually use this idea of the, the reset to market their products and services. And so here you can see Kelly Brogan, who was one of the leading anti-vaccine influencers circulating misinformation online. And Brogan sells her Vital Mind Reset 44-day program. You can also see Gwyneth Paltrow's products and books there, which are advocating a reset for um, healthy eating with that product there and a 10-day reset program. Now, the idea here with the reset is it's this start of a broader conversion process, a broader religious process. And as you can see here, this might be a seven-day hack to get people to convert, or a longer process, a longer commitment. But the point here is that this becomes part of a broader process. So here what you see is this wellness journey that people go on, where they, first of all, take the decision to reset their lives. Then they often find a guru to help them see the light. Then they embark on a broader journey of self-transformation. And the importance here in the context of wellness is that this is often a holistic journey. And because it is a holistic journey, it brings together mental, physical, and spiritual health. And then what often happens is that this story, this broader journey, is proselytized or shared to communicate and convert others. Another point to notice here is that the individual who goes on this wellness transformation is often in many ways mimicking the guru's own journey of transformation. And so you see many references where just as the guru helps them see the light, they then take it on themselves to help others through their story. And so just to end with the religious dimensions of wellness, what you often see here is that wellness is presented more broadly as a journey. And it adheres in this sense to the archetypal hero's journey, 
where the individual is called to pursue self-mastery and also to enact courage in the face of adversity. You might wonder, well, how does this relate to health? How does this relate to wellness? And the idea here is twofold. In the one sense, they're taking the courage to transform their lives, to experience pain and to overcome that pain to a place of health and relative well-being. But it's also this idea that their personal journey is then a form of authority in itself. That instead of having the credentials of, say, an expert, a medical expert or a scientific expert, that it's their journey that stands in for authority. And here I think it's just a good place to return to Jess Ainska, who I started today's talk with. This is a quote that was on Ainska's blog, and she says, I'm not an expert. I'm not a doctor or a nutritionist. I'm a health coach. But the thing that I do is I lead by example. I put my lifestyle out there. I show people what I have done to transform my life and kind of invite them to come along with the journey and take the parts that resonate with them. So it's not about telling people what to do. It's just about leading by example and showing people that there are other ways of doing things and hopefully providing them with a little bit of hope. The key point here is that it's her journey, it's her story that stands in for expertise. Okay? It's the, the journey is so prominent because that's their selling point. That's what markets the guru. So how does this relate to COVID? How does this relate to the misinformation that circulated? Here on this slide, you can see some of the key players that were spreading misinformation online during the pandemic. You have David Avocado Wolf, who we discussed before. You have a lot of the Trump rhetoric that was circulating in the wellness space. And you also have Sasha Stone, a new age out health guru. And during the pandemic, what we saw as a distinct change is that many of these individual wellness journeys were in fact supplanted by a more collective journey. And this was quite surprising in the wellness space. But just to give you an example, QAnon, the conspiracy theory, called on true believers to crowdsource and decode cryptic clues left by Q, a military intelligence officer. And Donald Trump and his devotees spoke of the need for a global detox, a purge of the deep state, of course, to be carried out by Trump. And in this sense, they're mirroring the spiritual awakening of the individual wellness journey. But the idea here is that this is a collective journey. And so it doesn't lead to my truth, it leads to our truth. And this is where you get the sense of the great awakening. It's a new paradigm shift in consciousness that is no longer occurring on an individual level. It is truth that is experienced at a collective level. And in this regard, the hero's archetypal journey is replaced by that of the rebel, an outlaw who is encapsulated by the pursuit of freedom to stand up to authority. So some of you may have heard of this term, conspirituality. And it's a term that was circulating in popular discourse prior to academics even studying it. But really, in the academic context, it's traced to a paper by Warden Voss back in 2011 entitled The Emergence of Conspirituality. And I won't read the definition here for you, but just to say that it's this term that brings together two core convictions. One is this idea, which is really an essentialist understanding of a conspiracy theory, this idea that there are these corrupt elites that either control or seek to control society. And the second is a more new age vision, this idea that we are going to experience a paradigm shift in consciousness. And so conspirituality brings together these two worlds, the fearful conspiratorial world with this more hopeful new age vision. And we saw this, many journalists uh, commented on this, as well as academics throughout the pandemic. And part of the reason for this, I've just created this Venn diagram um, a couple of years ago now, is because of the overlap be between many of the interests in these worlds. So what you see here are the overlap between, say, for example, wellness culture and the new age, with this emphasis on self-discovery, self-actualization, um, wellness culture and conspiracy theories, a distrust of the governments and elites, and if I had more space, I would have just said institutional authority. And new age spirituality and conspiracy theories, this promise that things could be better. 
And I have Sasha Stone here again, just because if you can actually read the comments of his former Instagram post, his Instagram account kept getting suspended, but I did manage to scrape his post. So if you look there, you'll see in hashtags, he's often talking about this ascension that will take place. It's not just a great awakening, it's a, it's a collective ascension that we are all part of. Now to return to this theme of metaphors, military metaphors were also central to how this new paradigm shift in consciousness was articulated. And I think a really important example of this is the anti-vaccine space. So if you look at people who were spreading vaccine and anti-vaccine um, discourse, often they would present the body as a battlefield. And there's this idea that you need to stand up by refusing vaccination to the authority of the state. And much of the criticism of government vaccine mandates was presented in this way, invoking military themes and military metaphors to really not just articulate the importance of standing up to the state, but as I'll discuss in a little more detail, as a call to action. And this is where the red pill that we formally discussed uh, becomes important again. So as I said, this idea of the red pill is a decisive moment when one chooses, and this is the crucial thing, it's a, it's a conscious decision, to see the truth, to experience the truth and remove oneself from the falsity and the system that is preventing them from seeing life as it really is and experiencing it as it really is. And the idea of the red pill gained traction in the manosphere with, as well as among outright um, groups before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, the difference is that we saw this idea of the red pill circulating on very mainstream health and wellness accounts where it didn't circulate before. Now the idea here with this metaphor is that the metaphor represents conversion and indeed radicalization, if you are viewing it from a different perspective, as an instant effect. It is something that by virtue of taking the red pill, that you will be transformed from ever. You can never go back and it's instant. And what I want to highlight here is that in reality, this is not how conversion takes place. That in fact, when we look at the role of metaphor in actually influencing and converting people to take a more extreme or radical position, that in fact, this tends to be a more um, slow, gradual process that involves different external stimuli, maybe on social media, maybe in one's daily lives and also involving their own personal experiences, typically a negative experience with some form of authority, which could be totally outside the context of health, but influence their negative view of, say, the healthcare system. Now, one way that I found it useful to understand this process of radicalization is through what I've termed the purity paradigm. And the idea here with the purity paradigm, which is what you see on the right, is that radicalization and conversion actually involves different levels of commitment. And so rather than being an instant transformative event that takes place where one adopts more extremist views or becomes red-pilled, that actually it's a more gradual process where one embarks with different communities online and certain beliefs and worldviews become reinforced. Now, Purity is a really crucial way to understand this and religious metaphors more generally because in many senses in wellness, this is how wellness as a field became a gateway to online radicalization and misinformation. And this is of course because wellness, as we've previously discussed, places so much emphasis on bodily purity. Okay, it's clean eating, as we said, on healthy eating, on a clean body um, and ideas about disease and impurity and dirt. And the purity paradigm really tries to articulate these different levels of commitment. So just briefly for the sake of time, stage one involves these mind-body purification techniques. And these tend to be fairly innocuous beliefs and practices. Things such as clean eating, cleansers, yoga, meditation, pranayama, breathing exercises. Things that are generic, and many of you may have even experienced them yourselves. There's nothing that radical about it yet. But many people who actually embark on this wellness journey will then go to the next stage, which tends to be more about spiritual purification and spiritual awakening. And this is where you'll often see the language about evolving, about enlightening. 
and in the context of COVID, it being more of a collective enterprise. Now, when this occurs collectively, this is where you get this idea about a more elevated conscious community. And the idea here in a Durkheimian sense is that this conscious community is sacred. It is set apart from the profane. And there's this where you start getting more pejorative terms, such as someone who is red-pilled is awakened compared to sheep or muggles or normies, as they are pejoratively referred to. And this is when the radicalization starts becoming more extreme and it can often lead to moral supremacy, which is then articulated not only in terms of a spiritual superiority, but often in terms of actually a biological superiority. And so in a lot of the wellness spaces, people who would adopt this worldview would talk about um, their elevated status by virtue of rejecting the vaccine as a pure blood. And it's not only that they were a pure blood, and they were more virile or more attractive, both cognitively and physically, but then they would only aspire to connect with people like them. This kind of supremacy biologically by virtue of the decision not to be vaccinated. We also see this in the type of xenophobic claims that proliferated in this wellness space. And so this would be things such as dehumanizing others as Zionists, Sabbateans, Satanists, and reptile lizards. Now here I just have a screenshot just to show you how this actually was articulated on social media. Because one of the wellness influencers who we looked at briefly, Pete Evans, he was repeatedly uh, suspended online. But as a result of that, he actually created his own uh, offline space where he could create a retreat center and many of these like-minded followers could commune. And the idea here, as you see through the very explicit branding, is it's an evolved sanctuary, okay? It's not just that these people are aspiring to be more enlightened and to wake up, they are. Now, we can't really talk about purity without bringing up the classic Mary Douglas. And the reason I bring up her work, which is obviously groundbreaking in the context of religion and purification and taboo, is I think it provides many clues about why we have seen many of these conspiracy theories tilt right during the pandemic. And people were often surprised that anti-vaccination movements that in the 60s were often very left-leaning became more right-leaning during the pandemic. And in her work, she actually gives some clues to this. So Mary Douglas highlights that everybody universally finds dirt offensive. But of course, the idea is that what constitutes dirt differs in different contexts. The idea being, as she says, there is no such thing as dirt. No single item is dirty apart from a particular system of classification in which it does not fit. Now, while she highlights this, this idea about classifying and taboo structures as universal, she highlights that they are mainly conservative in effect because they are trying to protect this abstract constitution. And so as a result, it's quite fitting that many of these purification metaphors during the pandemic tilted right, because it was this idea about conserving, protecting um, these values and liberties that were held closely. Now, I briefly want to touch on how technology and the media fueled misinformation that circulated during the pandemic before closing with how we can hope given this to counter it. So part of the way in which these influencers were able to spread this misinformation is because of their micro-celebrities. And micro-celebrity is this term that was coined back in 2008 by Theresa Sempt. And Theresa Sempt really used it to describe this way of achieving fame online. And of course, you should see straight away that the demarcation between a micro-celebrity and a mainstream celebrity is that whereas a micro-celebrity uses social media and blogs and various online platforms to achieve a sense of fame, that's demarcated from a celebrity who would, say, use television or film and these more top-down processes. Now, micro-celebrities use these three different techniques in order to establish trust and influence among their community. 
The first is this idea about accessibility. And the idea here is that it's in, an impression of being ordinary and just like you. And the distinction again here is with these mainstream traditional celebrities who are filtered, who are edited and produced by these powerful executives. And they're out of reach. And one of the ways in which we see this idea of accessibility transpire is through this capacity for direct messaging. So we all know that you could follow somebody who's a micro celebrity or an influencer online, and in many cases you can direct message them. It's this impression that you are so close to them despite their celebrity status. And this is not something that many people can do with a mainstream celebrity. The second is this idea of autonomy. And the important point here is that the impression is that the micro celebrity is outside of the system. So what happens here is that they are seen as actually creating fame on their own. They're not actually produced by the powerful executives. And as a result, they're not censored. They are more free to actually speak their truth um, and not confined by what many of these people would call the MSM. This leads on to the idea that micro celebrities are more authentic than a mainstream celebrity. And so if you follow influencers online, you'll often hear them describing themselves as authentic. I need to be authentic to my brand. And really what authenticity means here is, yes, more real, more genuine, but it's a performance. It's an idea that, they, again, they're not being controlled, they're not being manufactured, they're being themselves. You can trust me because I say it like it is, which for many people should bring alarm bells, like a kind of Donald Trumpian uh, ethic. But the importance here, aside from establishing what are often called parasocial relationships, is that this creates this illusion that out media is more trustworthy. And so many people who were spreading misinformation during the pandemic would actually say, people are turning away from the mainstream media. Nobody can believe the mainstream media anymore. In fact, they're turning to these alternative media platforms to get the truth. It's the only place you can get the truth. And so here we have Sasha Stone, one of his quotes, where he says, the beautiful thing is that people are now paying attention to out media voices and influencers and no longer paying attention to the mainstream narrative so much. Uh, here I also have a couple of, of the Instagram posts of Pete Evans before he was suspended. And again, you can see this kind of mimetic imagery, which is, again is very critical of the mainstream media who you can't trust. Now, in the context of health, it's not only the mainstream media that can't be trusted. This extends to the medical establishment and the scientific establishment as well. So here you see some of the posts that were shared by the wellness and out health influencers spreading misinformation. And it's this idea that the mainstream medical narrative can't be trusted. I won't trust the government, they're not my doctor. So this leads to the final part of this presentation, which is really, about how can we counter it? I think it's one thing to note how misinformation circulates and spreads in the context of today's talk, the power of metaphor to make these claims compelling, the power of technology to circulate them. But now I want to look at what can be done and more importantly, what can each and every one of us do in playing a role to counter misinformation. At the start of the pandemic, many of the tech companies came together with exactly this problem. And we saw something quite novel, which is that seven of the major tech platforms came together and pledged to combat misinformation. So this included companies such as Twitter, Reddit, uh, formerly Facebook. And what they said is that they would do this in two ways. The first is that they would remove or demote what they consider to be misinformation, so false and misleading information. The second was something that hadn't really been tested as much, and this was to elevate what they termed authoritative advice. So this was advice that was shared by the government, but also reputable corporations and, and companies, and in, this was in many places geographically targeted. So in the UK where I reside, it would be the NHS, who was this authoritative source. And what this meant in a practical sense is that when we were logging onto social media, we would often 
experienced this pop-up that would say, as you can see on the screen, looking for coronavirus info. If so, go to this website. And if you were searching for a term that was deemed to be associated with misinformation or a risk, you might get this pop-up as well, or a post might have a label, again, directing you to these official authoritative sources. Now, one of the problems with this approach is that when companies were taking down posts and removing it, or even suspending accounts, the reaction was a claim of censorship. And so these out health and wellness influencers were often making claims that by virtue of speaking the truth, they were being censored. And that is why their posts were being removed or demoted. And they would often tie this to the idea of a globalist agenda, a new world order. And the idea here is that the mainstream media is complicit in this because it's the mainstream media and big tech who control the narrative. So what you see here is Russell Brand, who has become highly conspiratorial during the pandemic, but also this idea, which he didn't coin, but he's popularized, of the censorship industrial complex. It's this idea that there are many organizations and institutions who are working together in a very orchestrated way to censor the truth from the public. And this is part of the problem with removing these posts, because part of the way that misinformation gains traction in these spaces is because these influencers are able to actually critique the mainstream media. And when their posts are removed, it basically proves their story that they are being controlled, that they are being censored, not because they're spreading misinformation, but that because they're spreading a truth that the government doesn't want you to know. The government wants you to stay in the matrix, to stay asleep. And so their authority, really, in this regard, is not simply presented as an alternative by using social media to establish fame. It's a rejection of the mainstream in all its various forms, as we've just showed, basically seen. And this is why the current approach by governments and various uh, institutions to actually elevate authoritative content is unlikely to be helpful because the people who actually need that content most don't trust it. And so even if you provide it as a pop-up or you, you know, link a banner on a post, they're not going to go there in the first place. And if they saw this content, they won't believe it because they don't believe the authors who are sharing it. The second aspect here is that by taking down and removing posts, it really leads to this idea of persecution. And I've referred to this as the persecuted hero narrative or complex. And the idea here again is that you've got this conspiratorial mindset where corrupt evil elites control society. You seek to expose this corruption. You heroically reveal the truth. And as a result, your content is removed, you're censored. But the important difference here is that that censorship acts as a rallying call to mobilize followers to defend not only the truth, but broader principles of freedom and justice. And I think a really good example of how this is playing out right now is the presidential campaign in the US with RFK Jr. And so if you've been following RFK, you'll notice that for a long time, he's positioned himself on his website, the company, the Children's Health Defense, as a defender. He's a rebellious outlaw. And he explicitly has these headings, big government, big tech, big business. Right? That's who he is a defender against. He wants to protect the ordinary people. He plays into this populist narrative. But what you can see here on the slide is also these claims of censorship. And he's actually testified about these claims of censorship. But it's been highly effective right, in gaining momentum for his presidential campaign. He's now polling at around 20%. Now, what I think is quite striking is how this idea of justice, it's a principle that is so intrinsic to the left, social justice, has really been weaponized by many of these outright or extremist figures um, to mobilize their followers. So it's not justice for the marginalized or justice for those who are really impoverished. Um, it ends up being used to promote a more right-wing agenda in the context of COVID. Finally, I want to look at the strategy of debunking. And while I want to acknowledge that there are good and useful ways of debunking, especially when it's done respectfully, 
During the pandemic, many of you would, would have seen something like this, right? So I'm giving you a case study with example to ivermectin. And instead of just criticizing or refusing ivermectin, many people uh, shared memes, especially on Twitter, uh, reducing anybody who was an advocate of ivermectin to a horse because they were promoting horse paste. Now, of course, ivermectin is used um, as horse paste, but it is also used in humans uh, as a remedy for river blindness, among other treatments. And the point here is that while this can seem very witty and funny and through mockery and ridicule, we can get many likes and shares online, actually, I think it's very critical that we start looking at the other effects that this type of shame really is generating. Because in my own work, what I've seen it do is not really just convince the people who are already convinced that this is not an effective treatment. What it does is it actually pushes people in the middle or people who are already skeptical of the official narrative further. And in so doing so, it fuels polarization. It also means that we know this from research that people are more likely to double down on their belief. Now, as part of my research, I follow people's newsletters quite closely. This is a very important space because uh, even places like Telegram are very easy for people to observe and view. And so some of the most interesting content and the most radical content is actually in personal newsletters. And what I want to show you here is one of the unintended effects of debunking in humorous form. There had been of sorts a meme war occurring online between these people who were mocking anybody who showed any interest in ivermectin and people who were pushing back. But actually, David Avocado Wolf, who I studied quite closely, was then using these memes uh, to sell ivermectin. So what they were doing was really weaponizing this humor and not only refuting it through a kind of form of mimetic warfare, but you would click on these memes and then it would direct you to these sites where you could buy hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin pills. And the reason I think this is important is because there is no silver bullet with misinformation. We've got this problem, this is what the conference theme is this year, and I don't think anybody has one answer. But having had over two years of analyzing the effects of different strategies to counter misinformation, one thing that we can acknowledge is that shaming and ridicule doesn't do anything good other than push people further and polarize them. And as I said, often result in unintended consequences, which, which people would not want. And so I end by really not offering one solution to counter misinformation, but I think given that most of us would be social media users, reflecting on our part, because I think we all have a role in terms of not so much just what we consume, but what we share, what we post for irony, what we click on, what we retweet. And really, I think that comes back to the foundation of our democracy. Thank you.